is a is a uh, what a POC is a T uh, is a next generation week where we uh, the focus is on catching our children early and young for the Lord, and uh, we've been asked to pray for the next generation, not just to pray for them, but to disciple them and to uh, teach them the way of the Lord. And so by before the, the end of the service today, we're going to be praying for all children here from the age of uh, one day to 17 and a half. Amen. 18 becomes an adult in Canada here. Amen. And so we'll be praying for our children. But I'm just going to share something this morning that also is relational to this week as we talk about children, as we talk about our teenagers and preteens and the next generation. Amen. Uh, but before anything, if you have your Bible, can you open to the book of Luke, chapter 15, from verse 11 to 31? Uh, I'm just going to read a very popular story, but we're going to be looking at it differently again, God willing. Uh, Luke chapter 15 from verse 11, and he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Give me the share of the property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed the pawns that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to just underline that place and just go back and keep thinking about it. He came to himself. He, he came to himself. Nobody told him. And that is self-realization is the key to complete victory in life. Uh, you, mo you must come to yourself at a point. You must come to yourself. He came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants? Oh, Jesus, help me here. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants had more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. This was what he recited to share with his dad in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him. If you were here a few t uh, Sundays ago, we talk about compassion. Where there is no compassion, there can be no healing. And the cruz of our Christian faith, the foundation, what authenticate what we do is compassion. And the father was filled with compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him and said to the son, Father, and he said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate and now his oldest son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked these things, what these things meant and he said to him, your brother came. Uh, your brother has come, your father has killed, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he had received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in, and his father came in and entreated, entreated him. But he answered his father, look, this many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. 
yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Verse 30, you can underline that. But when this son of yours came home, who has devoured your property with prostitute, you killed a fattened calf for him. In verse 31, and he said to him, son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. But he didn't know that ignorance, the Bible said my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And one of the greatest weapons the enemy uses to destroy us as children of God is knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, uh, Solomon, who being one of the wisest men and that's ever lived, uh, said to us in the book of Proverbs, and, and he said, in all your getting, he said, he said, wisdom is the principal thing. You know, he said, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. I think in, in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, uh, Solomon said something. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. You know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And he said, in all your getting, get understanding. That is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom. <coughs> wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. <coughs> Excuse me. And wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is applied knowledge. Very simple, eh? Very difficult. When we hear the word wisdom, we just get, oh man, you have to be like Solomon or gray haired like me that is coming now and now. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, wisdom, <coughs> the simple definition of wisdom means applied knowledge. So wisdom is the principal thing. So Solomon said, get wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. And he said, in all your getting, get understanding. Because the thing is this, knowledge in of itself, without understanding, is destructive. And the only way a man can be defined as wise or termed wise is when he's able to apply the knowledge acquired. And how can I apply knowledge acquired if I don't understand the knowledge? So he said, wisdom is the principal thing. But in all your getting, get understanding. Because if I'm able to understand the information that is being passed on to me, then I can excel in life. And so my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. When I don't have knowledge of a thing, you know, like they say in another definition, abuse simply means abnormal use. When the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse becomes inevitable. When I don't know the reason for a wife, then I abuse her. I use her abnormally. When I don't know why God has blessed me with children, then I use them abnormally. That is what it means to abuse, abnormal use. When a purpose of a thing is not known, abuse becomes inevitable. So when I don't know why God has given me this thing, to end, that has an, whatever God has entrusted to my care, whatever God has blessed me with, if I don't know why he's given it to me, then I will use it abnormally. And wisdom is what gives me understanding. So he said, in all your getting, get understanding. I'm emphasizing this for a reason. The man that we read, the last part of the story, was a man who stood in the house, who walked with the father, who lived in the house with the father. He lived in the midst of plenty, but yet was in want all the days of his life. And he did not understand. You know, uh, uh, David, who is the father of the wisest man, said, A man in honor and does not know it is like a beast that is perishing. One of the greatest tragedy of man is to be in a place of honor, to be exalted, and you don't know that you've been exalted, to know, not knowing who you are. Nothing brings freedom than knowledge. When you know who you are, and knows whose you are, then exploit become inevitable for you. And knowing is the key 
And so Jesus speaking in John chapter 8, verse 32, he said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Nothing liberates or liberates a man like knowledge. Know it. And so my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I want to emphasize that. And the reason why this man stayed in that house, and yet... was knowledge. He missed out because he didn't know his position as a sword. He didn't know his father. He didn't know the father that he has. The father I know. The father he knows was different from the father that he is, that was that was standing before him. The man he was living with, the knowledge of the man that he lived it all, the, all, the, all his life was a limited knowledge. He didn't even know who fathered him. And when you don't know, he was a son, but he didn't even know. He had privileges and right, but he didn't even know. Because to know your father is to trust him and is to obey him, is to believe in him. What do you know? Again, I bring it back to us. We are in the house here this morning, the house of the Lord. What do you know about your father? Your heavenly father. Do you know him? What do you know about him? And we're going to talk both ways, both biologically and our spiritual father, which is our heavenly father, the greatest of all. Do you know him? How well do you know your father? Do you have just a head knowledge of him? Or do you have a revelational knowledge of this father? that owes the cartoons on the thousand hills. And the reason why I don't trust you is because I don't know you. And the reason why we don't trust God enough is because we don't know him enough. And sometimes to back to our own biological relationship, the reason why we don't trust some people is because we don't know them enough. Or we know them too well and we know what they're capable of doing. Amen. <laughs> right? It could be that all. That we've come to know this guy that man is not dependable. He's not trustworthy. I can't deal with this man because I know him. But let's look at it from the premise of knowing in a positive term. Do you know your father? The prodigal son, the one we call the prodigal son, the bad boy, knew something about the father that the other one didn't know. They, were, they lived in the same house, grew up under the same man, but they both have two different knowledge and understanding of this man. The prodigal son that we call knew his father. He knows him well. And knowledge was the key to that man's freedom prosperity and breakthrough in life. Look at the story this morning briefly. He had done all the bad things that you and I know. The capable of doing. He did the worst thing that he could do. But there was something about the father that he knew. And he knows and knew that the one who's been in the house who's been so legalistic, they know. It's not how long you've been in the church, my brothers and my sister. Amen. It's how well you know him. It's not the title you carry in the church. It's not the denomination that you go the name of your church. It is the knowledge of the Father that brings freedom and brings liberty. This young man knew his father. He became hungry. Let's fast track a little bit. And he said to himself, he said, one thing I know about my father that my father 
is a very generous and kind man. My father, even those who were supposed to be servants in his house, lived like kings. And here I am. Is this is how kind and compassionate. Now, the one that was the older brother lived in that house, but didn't see that aspect of his father. He didn't see the kindness, the large heart of his father. But this one who was supposed to be a rebel, who, who was a castaway, knew the father and was able to describe. He said, my father is a very kind man. Even those who are working under him have more than enough. They are treated well. How much more me, the son? Even if I go home and become a servant, my life will still be great. That is knowledge. And so trust is built upon knowledge. He has done everything bad. But the knowledge of the Father, Jesus said what? Well, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The knowledge of the Father was something that this young man knew that the older one didn't know. And I pray, as we talk about both our Heavenly Father and our Earthly Father this morning, but I want to focus on this aspect of the Heavenly Father. Do you know God enough? This boy knew his Father. If you know the story, he went back home. Trust is good upon knowledge. The knowledge of the Father was what built the trust for him to go back. Now back again, as we think about our next generation, bringing it back to our earthly Father, what instruction, even though he rebelled for a season, the Bible said, train up a child in the way that he should go. And that when he grow up, he will not depart from it. What instruction was he given while he was growing up? And how much of that instruction is taught in his brain is part of his rebellious attitude? What instruction, what knowledge, what was he taught by the Father that made him have so much trust and confidence in the Father? And that reminds me of the man called Isaac. We talked about him a few weeks ago. What made Isaac trust his father unto death? I've asked that question myself time and time again. Because we talk about our father Abraham, who is the father of faith. And like I said a few weeks ago, without Isaac, there is no Abraham. Without Isaac, that story would never have happened. If Isaac had refused to follow his father, we wouldn't have Abraham, the father of faith today. Isaac was a silent hero in that story. But what made Isaac trusted his father unto death? What made Isaac lay down and say, my father can kill me? And the story went to say that when Isaac's friends asked him the question, and said, why did you do what you did, knowing fully well that your father would have killed you? And Isaac would have this to say, historically. And he said, it would have been better for him not to have been born than to be born and not to do the will of his father. Why would Isaac trust his dad unto death. What is it about their relationship? Father and son relationship. What knowledge of Abraham does Isaac have that made him trusted him that much? What instruction was he given? 
The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, it says, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. And in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1, it says, and you begin to see how God talks about fathers learning to instruct their children in the ways of the Lord. What examples are we as fathers and mothers setting for our children to bring them up in the knowledge of the world? How do we catch the next generation? It is not the church that will do it for you. It's not the youth pastor that is going to do it for you. It's not the Christian school that is going to do it for you. It is you and me that will do it for ourselves. It is your responsibility. It's my responsibility. In Titus chapter 2 verse 7, they show yourself in all respect to be a model of good work. In some translations say an example in your teachings and show integrity and dignity in everything you do to your children. Because if we don't set the right example, like I always say, monkey see, monkey do, our children watch us more than they hear us. Amen. <laughs> Some of us that know that. It's not what we say mostly that makes the impact. It's what we do. Our integrity is much more in what we do than what we say. And so if we're going to catch the next generation, it's not going to come by screaming and shouting at them, which is necessary once in a while, especially when you have the children that we have today. Amen. <laughs> but after the screaming and the shouting, we must walk and live by example. The Bible says in the book of Acts, this is the beginning of what Jesus began to teach and to do. It is what you do examples are worth setting because the instructions of the Lord comes by saying and by doing and when we train our children to know us as fathers and mothers then we're going to have men and women that we can depend on and pass the baton or to the next generation what is your next generation going to be like your father instructed you in the ways of the Lord. But are you instructing your children in the ways of the Lord? That you have the guarantee that the next generation, if Christ tarries, or to the fourth and third generation, will stay the cause because of what you have planted and instilled in the lives of your children and my children. The Bible says of a king, a young king, in 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days because Jehadiah the high priest instructed him. He had somebody who was a father to him spiritually that was instructing him, leading him by example. The Bible, the word train simply means, I've said it time and time again, train a child in the way that he should go. Simply means it is the same root word for coaches that you have on the railway. It means to hook to yourself and drag along. Amen. And so if you're going to the pub, drag him with you. You can't say drinking is bad and you're drinking. Amen. If you're going out to get angry and to get angry and curse, drag him along. Let him watch that so that he can learn. If you're watching stuff on the internet that he, you know is bad, don't tell him it's not good. Let him watch with you. What is good for the goose is good for the gander. Is that not what they say? Amen. You must train. And so you, you make sacrifice for the next generation. And when we miss it, we destroy, not just ourselves, we destroy our children. The Bible will have this to say about Abraham. Even though he trained his child, and we see something in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. The Bible says, For I know that he will command his children and his household after him. Genesis 18, verse 19. What a testimony. 
For I have chosen him that he will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteous and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. The promises of God is riding upon your obedience to instruct your generation after you. But if as much as Abraham did well, one single mistake in the life of Abraham almost cursed and put a dent on his generation. In Genesis chapter 20, you can write it down and go study that. And Genesis chapter 26, Genesis chapter 20 verse 1 to 6, and Genesis chapter 26 verse 1 to 6. The same story happened concurrently, right? Like I said, monkey see, monkey do. In Genesis chapter 20, Abraham lied to a king, right? And said his wife was what? His sister. He lied. He didn't repent of that. He didn't change it. Years later, Isaac saw the father or heard about how his father lied. What happened? In Genesis 26, Isaac told the same lie, and it would have become a generational curse when sin are not confessed and dealt with. It becomes a pattern. David, a man after God's own heart, the same thing. In 2 Samuel 11, he committed murder and adultery. His children was watching. Right? And Abs uh, Amnon was the first to follow after his father. In Second Samuel chapter 13, Amnon went a step further. His father committed adultery. Amnon went and committed incense. He slept with his sister. And Absalom took it a step further, killed his own brother because he saw his father doing the same thing and was trying to take the kingdom away from his father. And you know the story. And he slept with all his father's concubines in public for all to see. A pattern was set. An example was set. What example are we setting for our children? Are we working in integrity? Are we working in compromise? In private? Are we sowing the right seed in the lives of our children? As we talk about the next generation, I remember an incident that happened between me and my children a few weeks ago. And, and God had to use that to teach me a lesson. There is no small or big issue here. Because when you sow the seed, it's going to grow. It may grow 20 years from today. When Abraham sowed that seed, Isaac wasn't born yet. But it began to grow in the family. But it was not doubtful. And the Holy Spirit began to remind me of that. He said, you have to be careful. You know, I was trying to hide something away from my boys, and I end up lying to them about it. And Courage was the first one to confront me on it. And he said, Dad, you lied about this thing. And I, and I was trying to make excuses. I was trying to justify myself to get away. First, I was embarrassed, but I was trying to, to make it look nice, right? And by doing that, I was trying to tell them that it's okay to lie as long as you can justify the reason for doing it. And so if they begin to lie to me tomorrow about other things, now, where did they learn that from? No, I showed it to them. And so the Lord had to call me on it, and I had to call the three of them down and confess and apologize there and then two days later or so. And I say, I'm very sorry you guys were right. I lied. I don't have any reason to do that. There is no excuse for that. Because it's important because you don't know the seed that you are sowing. Integrity as a father and a son is the watchword of our destiny. 
Because when we sow those seeds in our children's life, the Bible says, train them in the way they should. When they grow, let the enemy play around with their destiny. Like the prodigal son, they will remember their father. They will know something about their dad. And they will know, oh, this is a kind man. You know, uh, something about my children that they know, I didn't know that they watch me. Right? And I think it was uh, Greg uh, the other day was asking them. We came back. We, I, told, I said I was taking them out to Best Buy to go shopping. And we came back with nothing, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and Greg asked Courage. And he said, oh, what did your dad get for you? And the courage said, oh, you know my dad, he will pick this, it's too expensive. You pick this, it's too expensive. And we didn't buy anything. <laughs> why? You know why? They know that about me. If I don't buy things until it's cheap, until it's on sale, that is the truth. Whatever I, you save me with, as nice as they look, if it's not on the last penny, I can keep going back there 10 times until I get it for what I want. And so they've come to know that about me. So even if I say we're going out, they don't get angry. I realize that. I, can't, I wonder why they don't get disappointed that I promised them, oh, we're going to go out and go buy something. <laughs> I'm going to go buy you stuff. I'll buy this for you. We go and we'll come back and we'll not get it. And they don't complain because they know because I look at it, oh no, it's too expensive. We're not buying it now <laughs> until it's ready. So for that, they know that about me. They know that, okay, this man, I'm not cheap, but I just want to spend my money wisely. Amen. <laughs> you know, you have to reflect something about you because that is the integrity of heart that the children are looking for. As we train the next generation, what are we showing them? What examples are we showing our children? Are we trustworthy? Do we have integrity as parents, as uncles, as aunties, as grandparents? In, in Genesis chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, is an interesting, I want you to look at that in the King James Version, please. I want to show you something quickly here. Now, when I read that as a young Christian, that God can attest to the integrity of a pagan's heart. If you read the story of Job, more than anything else, what set him apart from all the men in the East was not his wealth, but it was the integrity of his heart. And that integrity was reflective in the way he was bringing up his children. And the Bible will say about Job, every now and then he will go and make sacrifice and appease to God the way he knows how to say, paraventure my children in their doing, they would have offended the Lord. Abraham, when Abraham trained up Isaac in such a way that when Abraham died, Isaac continued in the stead of his father. He was raising up altar like his father. David, when he realizes his mistake and began to correct it, he corrected that in the life of Solomon. But Solomon messed it up again. He said, did he not? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hand, have I done this? Can you see a man having a conversation with God and can come and say, God, look at my heart. And then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know, look at a testimony that you have acted in the integrity of your heart. And that's why I've kept you from dying. What is integrity? Is the quality of being honest and fair? Is the state of being complete or whole? Is the quality or state of being complete or undivided? Is the place of being completely complete, if there's a word like that? What is to be complete? Having all the necessary parts, not lacking anything, not limited in any way in your conduct. That is what gives you a testimony before your children and before God. How do we get the next generation 
is in the integrity of our heart. Because as a Christian parent, you cannot afford to live a passive, compromising Christian life and expect your children to follow suit. <laughs> a lady was saying the other day she wants her children to, to become, to, she likes the Christian way. Now this is funny, right? She likes, she thought she wants to see how she, she can be sending her children to church and a lot of people send their kids to Christian school thinking that, that it can be, sometimes it does happen, but 80% of the time it doesn't happen because the two hours they come to church is not enough. The four or five hours they stay in school is not enough. They live with you 24-7. If they can't be influenced at home, forget it. Oh, I want my children to, be, to have Christian values, but you don't have that value. How is that going to be? How is it going to be possible? Miracles do happen. People like us are standing here today because the miracle of God. Amen. We have no business being in the church because we were not trained in the ways of the Lord. It was the mercy of God. And the reason why we are losing the next generation is because, like I said, Christian parents are living a very compromised lifestyle in the private. At home, many Christian parents don't have an intentional approach to teach their children the ways of the Lord. How many, how many parents sit down with their children to pray together, to have Bible study devotion together? In this time and age, we get too busy and we leave that and we want to see things happen. It doesn't happen that way. We're losing the next generation because Christian parents don't intentionally pray with their families as a habit anymore. We are losing the next generation because many Christian parents have this superficial understanding of God and of their faith in the Lord. Like the one in the house, that son, the brother of the prodigal son. They don't know the God they are serving. And so they cannot even represent him well before their children. We're losing the next generation because many children rarely see their parents seeking the Lord earnestly and consistently anymore. We don't see that. Too many compromises at home. Too many compromises in the workplace. And we think they don't matter. Not because those little children, they see these things. And they grow up with that. And then we see they don't want to have nothing to do with church anymore. We can't understand why. There's an article I... Uh, I saw and I reposted it in the, on the church uh, page, Facebook, uh, Facebook Cornerstone page. Go read that. And it was very intensive. One of the things that I keep saying, and he, uh, what that guy, the man that wrote that article, put that up because I used to wonder. And he said, one of the greatest mistakes that we can make as parents is to sit down and discuss the negative thing about church before our children. tear down the pastor or that lady that you don't like in the church or the deaconess and how bad this is. and you say that in their presence and then the next Sunday you say let's go to church which church? <laughs> right? you know what I mean and so they can't wait to leave home they can't wait to get rid of that and so when they grow up they don't want to have anything to do with that and God is counting on you and me and so we must rearrest the next generation. Because if we intentionally live a life of truth and integrity, like the prodigal son's father, let the enemy take your child away. He will come back because he will have knowledge and he will remember his father. And this is what God is saying. That our children will come back if they were set a good example. Yes, some of them will miss the way, not because you were a bad parent, but if you stay consistently serving the Lord in truth and in spirit, they will come back. Because when the rubber meets the road, they're going to remember their father. They're going to remember. 
They're going to remember that praying mother. They're going to remember that compassionate woman. They're going to remember that virtuous woman. They're going to remember that woman that have dedicated her life and her service to the work of the Lord intentionally serving the Lord. They're going to remember that. And they're going to see the benefit and the blessings that follow them while they were doing that. And so when they are in the gutter of sin and that pit of destruction, the Lord is going to remind them that home can find peace. Remember the peace you grew up under. Remember the love that you experienced. Remember that prayer time that you used to have on that coffee table. You remember the time that you ought you to sit together on that dining table to share the word of the Lord. Remember the instructions of your father. You see the way your father is. You see how his life has been because he was a man of integrity. He followed after God passionately. See the end of your father and your mom. Can't, don't you want that? And he will say yes. But if there is nothing to reflect on, where are they going to turn to? Unless the mercy of God. People like us didn't have that example. I didn't grow up that way. I didn't even know what church was. The first time I went into a church building, I think I was 11 or 12, I can't remember. And what took me to a church was I was running away from my school principal. I was supposed to be in a boarding house. The first time I really entered a church on a Sunday was because I was running from the principal and I ran into the church. The only way I could be saved from getting punished was go to the house of the Lord. What an irony. And that is what it is. Anytime you are in trouble, the way where to run is the house of God. And it was a picture I didn't know that God was saying, you're going to run back to me one day. And I ran to the house of the Lord. That was my first experience with church. My mother got saved when I was already an adult. But with her short years in this world, she reflected the picture of Christianity, what it means to be a Christian woman. And I used to very, get very angry at her because of her virtue, her integrity, her love, her compassion. And I said, the reason why people like this, you guys are frustrated. You're not smart. You're not strong anymore. But no. And I was like I always say, my mother taught me everything I know. But she didn't sit me down to lecture me. It was her life that I saw. She didn't tell me, son, do this or do that. No. I looked at her. And she was everything I wanted to be. And the opposite was my dad. I look at my dad, and it's everything I don't want to be. As God is my witness. When I look at my dad then, I don't want to be that. I look at my uncles, I don't want to be that. I never want to be anything like them. They did not represent the right picture. I remember meeting a Christian in a very funny situation. Then I was still a Muslim one way or the other, right? And when I looked at them and I said, if this is Christianity, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. This next generation that are depending on you and me, are we going to change our ways? Are we going to give our children something like Abraham gave to Isaac? Are we going to give our children what this prodigal son was given by the father? I know they will pray this morning, not to overflow the issue. Jesus was well trained by the father. He said, as I see my father do, that is what I do. Amen. He said, as I hear from my father, that I will do. Jesus was an embodiment of obedience to the father. He had, he, 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 he said, when you have seen me, you have seen the father. He was not ashamed of his father. He was trained well by his father. So he was proud to be the son of his father. He said, when you have seen me, you have seen the father. He said, as he is, so am I. I do what my father tells me. He said, nobody take this life away from me. 
He said, I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. He said, this commandment have I received of my father. He was well instructed of the father. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Do, can your child say that of you? Can your daughter say that of you? I mean, can my son say that of me? That I know. I know what my father can do. And I say this humbly with all grace to God. That to a large extent, I realize that my children, they know me more than I know myself. And I don't know what I can do. And yesterday before we prayed, I, was doing, I, I did something. And the three of them just went and said, you are always doing that. Even in the church. And I was going to argue. And I, and I said, oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they see and they watch you more than you think. What you think they don't even see, they see. And if we don't arrest ourselves now and let that seed begin to germinate in them, because when we are doing it, we don't see anything wrong. But when it begins to become a mirror, and they begin to reflect our character and our nature. We begin to say, where is this coming from? What seed are we sowing? Do we have an Isaac in our children? Can our sons and daughters trust us? When the rubber meets the road, when they are caught up in the affairs of this world, would they be able to say like the prodigal son, I'm going home. I know my father. I know my mother. Or are they going to run away from home, farther off from home? Are they in a place where they say, I can't wait to leave home? As we pray for the next generation, it is more than prayer. It is time for us, it's never too late to set the example. It is never too late to begin to train them up in the way of the Lord. It is never too late to begin to set that godly Holy Ghost example to them. It is never too late for them to see a passionate woman of God. It is never too late for them to see a man or a woman of integrity. It's never to, because God says, I know you. That you will instruct your children. And instructing them is not just telling them, go to church or telling them, read your Bible. It's not telling them what to do. It's doing what you want them to do. If you want them to go to church, go to church. If you want them to stop telling lies, then you stop telling lies. If you want them to stop lying, then you stop lying. If you want them to stop getting angry and having a fit of rage, then you stop doing that. If you want them to be passionate about God, then be passionate about God. And we can rearrest the next generation. And I say it as we pray this morning. Can all the children come forward? what is happening today in our country. If your heart does not bleed in fear for this next generation, then I don't know what country you're in. What happened to our this nation? I always say this, and I, I didn't grow up here, but you know the good news is that I'm a Canadian now. <laughs> you know, that sounds funny. I'm getting used to that. Eh? Um, I'm a Canadian now. That is the truth. I'm a Canadian. Now, the people, the forefathers, our fathers, when I say that now, I can say it with confidence, with knowledge, and truth to it. Our forefathers that gave us this great nation. If the dead 
could speak, like we made to understand which are not the dawn, if they can turn really in their grave and they are able to see what Canada is becoming, if they can look into America, the country that was founded upon God and say in God we trust, a nation which constitution was written from sand, from coast to coast, having dominion, today, God is no longer allowed. You went to high school, you went with God. Your children don't go to school with God anymore. And that doesn't freak us in the heart. And it's okay. Can we all stand up, please? As we pray for those children, as they represent the next generation, as they represent your grandchildren and my grandchildren, great grandchildren yet to fall. Like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That we shall be, like the Bible says in Psalm 24, that we will become, this is the generation of them that seek the Lord, O oh God of Jacob. Please, can you put Psalm 24 here? That's what we're going to pray with you, James Rashford, please. As we pray for those children standing on the scripture for the next generation. And I want to throw a challenge to us. As they say, let it not just be the weak for the next generation, no. Let it be the years. For those of us who have grandchildren, children still growing, even those whom the enemy has taken away, this is the time to begin to pray and to begin to love them passionately back that the Holy Spirit, and this is, I believe, as we pray, you remember this to pray and say, Lord, as the prodigal son came to himself and remembered his father, my son, oh God, is over there. My daughter is over there. She went to Sunday school. I taught him or her your ways. But now the enemy has taken them away. Lord, your Holy Spirit convicted that man and he came to himself and he said, I will go back home. Lord, I pray also for my daughter, my son, that has walked away from home from the house of the Lord for how long I don't know. Lord, I will not rest until he come back home. Lord, I am standing upon your word because you change not. My generation unto the fourth will serve the Lord, and there will be no weak link spiritually anymore. I will call you over, have mercy on you. The earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof. The world and all that were therein, for he had founded it upon the sea. The grand cash and Canada is the Lord, and the fullness thereof. And Canada and all that dwell in Canada. For the Lord has founded Canada upon the seas and established Grand Cash upon the floor. Who shall ascend unto the hills of the Lord? Who shall stand upon his holy place? Father God, we declare this day that these children will be the one that will stand in your holy place. Father God, that this generation, O oh God, it shall be said of them that they are the generation that seek you, O oh God of Jacob. Ye that have a clean hand and a pure heart, that have not lifted up their soul unto vanity. Father, we pray that these children, O oh God, will not lift up their soul to vanity. The vain God of this generation will not sweep them away. The vain God of sexual perversion will not take our children. The vain God of materialism will not take this once in the name of Jesus. The vain God of iniquity and, and greed will not swallow this ones up in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we release your blessing upon this next generation. Lord, that they will carry the baton again. Lord, they will re Establish the foundation of the Lord, the hills of the Lord, O oh God. They will be the one, O oh God, that will become a voice of God. Lord, the second generation, the third, second and the third generation that has come forth from this congregation. We declare today, using this one as a point.
point of contact that none of them will be lost to the system of the world where we have failed as parents we ask oh God that you have mercy upon them in the name of Jesus where our children oh God where we failed our children Lord let your mercy triumph over every judgment in the name of Jesus where we failed in ignorance Lord we ask this morning that you will restore back unto us uh, the the passion for your kingdom again lord restore back what we fail to teach our children lord teach them because you promise in your word uh, that our children will be taught by you and great shall be their peace. So we pray, Lord, that you will teach them wherever they are, those who have already walked away from home, before we are able to teach them. For that, God, because you are a merciful God, for the Lord, I stand here at the point of contact. If a man like me, that was not brought up in the knowledge of your will. A man that never stepped into the church until he was a full-grown adult. Heavenly Father, and you still had mercy on me. You plucked me out of darkness, oh God. How much more these children? Some of them went to Sunday school. Some of them came to church until they were 11, 12, and 13. <coughs> Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus. You that had mercy on people like me. Father God, have mercy upon our children. Lord, as we release this next generation, we release grace for restoration unto them in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We decree every gate, O oh God, that is standing in opposition to their destiny to be lifted up. Every everlasting door that is standing against them be lifted up. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. We, we release the children for honor and for glory. None of you will be cut short in the midst of your youth. None of you will die before your time in the name of Jesus. Your parents shall not bury you in the name of Jesus. You will live to marry and have children if the Lord tarries in the name of Jesus. And your children will serve the Lord alongside you in the name of Jesus. We'll speak hope into this generation in the name of Jesus. Thank you, eternal Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you, Lord. Father God, we thank you. We pray, Father God, for this community. We pray for the children in this community that are in darkness. We ask, so oh God, for a deliberate plan from heaven to help win them back into the house in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father God, for every family here, Father God, that have a son or a daughter in the far country, O oh God, of unbelief. We ask, O oh God, that same God that arrested the prodigal son, you will arrest them all in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. For those of us, O oh God, who need strength, O oh God, from your table this morning, we sanctify this table. We cover it with the blood of Jesus. And we ask, O oh God, let your strength be made perfect in our weakness in the name of Jesus. We pray for restoration. We pray for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to come to our rescue even this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the favor and the grace of the Lord rest upon you and your household. May this week be a week of testimony for you and your family in the name of Jesus. May the Lord turn away your captivity and fill your mouth with laughter. We decree that every gate of opposition be lifted in the name of Jesus. Let the King of glory step into that situation, bringing respite and relief to you in the name of Jesus. May healing be melted out from the cross of Calvary for you that is sick this morning in the name of Jesus. For he that needs the job will pray for an open door that no man can shut in the name of Jesus. For that relationship that is wobbly, we bring it back, in, we bring peace into that situation in the name of Jesus. We pray for the week of favor. Thank you, eternal Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. If you need to spend time and uh, just serve yourself this morning for the communion, you can do that. If not, go with God. See you on Wednesday for Bible study. And then one quick announcement. On, uh, on next Sunday, bring your prayer requests.
uh, if you just if you are going home, take time and write all your prayer requests, and you can put it in an envelope. You're just going to keep it every Sunday. You bring it, you pray over it, and you take it back home, and you continue until the answer comes. Keep taking it and taking it and taking it until it is done. Amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful afternoon.